your Bible, let's go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. We started last week by giving a small overview of what the Bible's about. And we pointed out that the Bible is not a book full of human heroes who did great things for God. Now, I know that's often the way it's presented. You know, kind of like the Bible is, is a guidebook and look at it and you know, God puts these people on display so that we can imitate them. Um, we assume, don't we, that the best models of the Christian life are the heroes and the heroines of our faith. And we hold such people up before the eyes of our children because we want our children to aspire to be like these people. And anyone with even a passing familiarity with these stories knows that our children are partly being lied to. Oh, didn't expect that so soon in the message, did you? I, I came across this quote. One author suggests that biblical stars, like famous people of today and of every generation, have a large pile of bones rattling around in their closets. And often these bones spill out onto the floor for the world to gawk at. So what we saw last week, actually, the Bible is actually a catalog of outlaws in need of God, in need of a God who graciously comes to rescue us from our mistakes. And it is this incredibly encouraging uh, God that only loves and uses broken people. Some of you ask, well, why do you call yourself a church for broken people? Because there really aren't any other kind, are there? So God not only loves and uses broken people, he does the same with guilty people, with non-heroic people, because it means, I'm thankful he does that, because it means he uses people like you and me. Amen? All right, let's jump into this. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 5, read down through verse 8, it'll be on the screen behind me as well. It says, verse 5, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with it, with them, the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I've made them. Verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Interesting, isn't it? One of my favorite authors is a guy by the name of Chad Bird. And he wrote this about the Bible. He said, uh, Many of the Bible's family portraits look like a Norman Rockwell nightmare. That's good. He said, there are tales of horror where men and women do unspeakable things to those they are called to love. In these stories, it's husband against wife, child against parent, brother against brother. There is no whitewashing of sin within the story of God's family. The sheer fact that all of these details in these people's lives were chosen to be chiseled into the stone of God's word tells us something. Even though we may be dragging the skeletons of failed marriages and wayward children, even though we have screwed up in massive ways, even though we have acted out of lust and hatred and selfishness and revenge, we know a God who takes pity on us. God forgives. God loves. Amazingly, he even uses people like us. How like God to have us sing so many songs by David, who most remember as an adulterer and a murderer. Interesting. But whom God remembers as a friend. Are you from or in or the cause of a screwed up family? Take heart. God paints his own family portraits with failed people. And he's quite willing to include you in the picture with his arms of grace slung around your shoulders. I like that. But it's true, isn't it? We read the Bible and we see so many pictures of self-destruction. 
There's so many pictures of betrayal. And yet what we find behind all of those stories is a God of grace who pursues and loves and forgives and even uses failed people. You've heard me say it so many times. God loves broken people. And again, why? You tell me. Why does he love broken people? That's all there is. There really aren't any other kinds of people. And the Bible makes it clear that God is in the business of pursuing and using doubters and deniers and adulterers and murderers and failures of every kind. God only loves flawed people because flawed people are all that there are. But, this is where things get interesting, Noah seems to buck that trend. Noah seems to be an exception to the rule. We read in the stories all, all, about all this evil and wickedness that started to take place not long after God created everything, and yet there was Noah, a beam of light. He seems to be the first good guy in the Bible. Think about it. Adam, sinner. Eve, sinner. Cain, big sinner, killed his brother, right? But Noah? Now, I understand it takes us all the way to chapter 6, but we finally arrive at a good guy. A guy who doesn't seem to need grace. That's good. That's good. Somebody's got their Bible going. Anytime. Anytime. We would never know who it was from the flush on your face and the red and everything else. But God has grace for all. Okay. But when you look at Noah, I mean, come on, good people don't need grace, right? Only bad people need grace. And when you look at Noah, he is clearly one of the good guys. So, if you're like me, according to many, many Sunday school lessons, Noah is a hero. Noah is a guy who did something great. He stood in the face of tremendous opposition. His faith was strong. His devotion to God was unwavering. He obeyed God, even though God asked him to do something that was seemingly impossible. Now, I want to remind you that at that time, at Noah's time, to the best of our knowledge, it had never rained on the earth. So when God came and said, I'm going to send a rainstorm, and water is going to cover the earth. These people had no way of understanding what that was really going to be like. No one had ever heard of anything like that. And then God asked Noah to build this ridiculously large boat in the middle of the desert. And everybody's making fun of it. I have no doubt his wife made fun of him. I'm sure his kids made fun of him. Um, and yet he did it. And what we fail to remember is that it took him over 100 years to build this boat. Wow. Not going to get that project over in a weekend, are you? Yeah. Over 100 years, he was faithful. That's Noah. And that's basically the story that I have heard since I was a kid. Every Sunday school lesson that I ever heard about Noah went something like this. Remember... You too can believe what God said, just like Noah. You too can stand up to the wickedness in our world, just like Noah. Don't be like the bad people who mocked Noah. Be like Noah. He proves you can be a good person, even if you're surrounded by evil. And that was the gist of the story. That was pretty much what we were taught. And I understand why we think this. But what I want to share with you this morning is that's a pretty wrong interpretation of the story. And let me explain to you why I think that's a wrong interpretation. Noah himself was as much in need of grace as everybody else. Now, I understand why we tend to not think that's the case. Because look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, Noah was a righteous man, and he walked faithfully with God. That's good, right? That part's pretty clear. But 
one of the things we point out around here is you, you can't really fully understand a particular passage or verse if you don't understand the surrounding context. If we don't understand what was going on before that verse and what was going on after that verse. If we don't understand that, then we're going to misinterpret it and we're going to read it in the wrong way. So we can't really understand verse 9 without understanding its context, specifically what comes before it. So what came before verse 9? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Because I'm going to read it again. Let's start in verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Verse 6, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Verse 7, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. And then verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So that brings you up to verse 9. Now let me just stop here and point out. Let's go back to verse 5 for just a moment. I want you to notice all of the superlatives in verse 5. Does that take you back to English class in school? Superlative? Every inclination. Did you catch that? Every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart, it's, it, and that's every human heart, if you look at this the right way, it's every human heart, and every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil. Making a point? Only evil once in a while? All the time. That language does not leave much room for exceptions, does it? No. Now, some people read this passage, and they kind of picture God scouring the earth to find anyone who is righteous. He's looking and looking and looking, and then one day, just about the time he's ready to give up, he's been searching high and low, God sees in the distance this beacon of light. Yeah. It's one of those days, isn't it? Do we all, like, need to take our phones and turn them off real quick or turn them down real quick? Or If you get it out right now, every, you'll, they'll think you're just, a, you're just doing what I asked you to do. And now nobody wants to move. Okay. Yeah. Those of you who don't have phones, you were moving. Thank you. I appreciate that. So God is looking everywhere. He sees off in the distance this beacon of light, and he goes, Oh, my goodness. What is that over there? It's Noah. Thank God there's at least one. There's one who's good in the face of all this evil. I'm glad that there's at least one. And who is it? Noah. But that's not what the story's really saying. Now, I also want to point out in verse 8, when it says Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, the word favor can also be translated as grace. A better translation of that verse would be that God graced Noah. When it says he found favor, it could just as easily say God graced Noah. What am I saying? His eyes captured Noah. When he saw Noah, he saw him through eyes of grace. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is this. The whole world was bad, including Noah. Every human, every inclination, only evil all the time. So the whole world is bad, including Noah. But God graced Noah. So you put that order together, here's what it would sound like. Noah, along with everybody else in the world, is not good. God gives grace to Noah, that's in verse 8, and then Noah walks with God, that's verse 9. Now that order is very important because if we get it backwards, then we start reading this story as if Noah is a good guy whom we should try to be like. We don't think he's a guy who needs grace, just like everybody else needs grace. 
and because he doesn't need God's grace, maybe that's why God chose him to do something amazing. And that's the implication we get if we don't read it the right way. If we don't read it in its proper order. Noah, along with everybody else in the world, is not good. This is the proper way. And then God gives grace to Noah, verse 8. And then Noah walks with God, verse 9. That order is crucial to the story, but not just to the story, it's also crucial to our understanding of Christianity as a whole. And I love to talk about this with people. You see, walking with God does not lead to God's favor. But we tend to think it does. Walking with God does not lead to God's favor. God's favor leads to walking with God. Do you see the difference between those two? Huge difference. The difference here is the difference between religion and Christianity. And this is part of what sets the crosswalk apart from so many churches. I'm not here today to tell you how to make God happy. I can send you to other churches if that's what you want to find out. But we have some other things we need to talk about. See, religion is about our goodness being rewarded. Oh, how many Bible verses did you read? Let me pat you on the back for that. Christianity, on the other hand, is about our badness being forgiven. And those two are not similar at all. They're actually opposed to each other. And if we get this order backwards, we will misunderstand God and we will misunderstand ourselves, and we will misunderstand the world, and we will misunderstand life. People say, and we understand, religion is about doing things for God, about becoming a better person, about sinning less. Christianity, on the other hand, is not about any of those things. Christianity is about a gracious God who loves and rescues people who keep messing up. So if you're sitting here today and you are perfect and you don't still mess up, I'll give you a pass. You can go ahead and go home because you're not going to enjoy the rest of the message. We're not going to say a word about that, are we? I'll trust you to cover it later. Yeah, that's what marriages are for, right? Even after God wipes all of these evil people off the face of the earth. And you notice what he does. He uses Noah and his family to repopulate the earth. But it's not more than a generation after that that everything's bad again. So interesting. We read this pattern over and over in Scripture. We never see, I wish I could find it, we never see somebody who just gets to a good spot and stays there. They don't. When I was growing up, and my dad and mom used to take us to revival meetings a lot, and uh, one of the things I remember being talked about was how we don't want to be backsliders. You remember that? Some of you growing up in the church, we don't want to backslide. But you know what goes through my mind when I hear a statement like that? It's like, find me a Christian who is not in a perpetual state of backsliding. That is, unless you're perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Come on, we are professionals at backsliding, amen? Okay, I'm assuming everybody in the room agrees with me on that. We're pros at this, all of us. So if we understand this Noah story to be about a good guy who doesn't really need God's grace, and he does what God tells him to do, even though it's hard and tough, If that's what we believe, then we're going to think that Christianity is mainly about good people doing good things for a good God. And it won't take us very long trying to do that to realize that we're not as good as we thought we were. And if that's what we believe, then we're going to end up in one of two places. We're either going to be in a place of what I call delusion, where we tell ourselves, hey, I'm actually doing it. Wow, look at the progress I've made. Look at me. I'm better than that person. I had to be careful who I pointed at there. So So we could end up in a place of delusion where we're deluding ourselves. Or if we don't go there, the more honest place is to end up in a place of despair. 
where we say, I can't do this. If this is what Christianity is about, then I don't have the willpower. I don't have the stamina. And most of the time, honestly, I don't even have the desire. So if this is what Christianity is, then Christianity must not be for me. I think it's incredibly important as you know, if you've been around here for any length of time, it's important for us to understand the distinction between these two things. So if you look at what's on the screen right now, I want you just to look at that because it's something that we say around here from time to time. Christianity is about a gracious God who loves and rescues messed up people. Now, it's so interesting to me that when people hear something like that, a lot of people get confused. And some of the reason for that confusion is that they've been taught that if you are a Christian, one of the signs that will prove that you are a Christian is that you are getting better and better and better as time goes on. Now, the word better is specifically defined as it pertains to our behavior. So it would be your behavior is getting better and better. And I, maybe I don't have to tell you this, but in the Gospels, there was one group of people that were really into this. They were called the Pharisees. Their whole life was, I want to be better for God. I want to be better for God. I, 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 they were all about better. And they were all about behavior, behavior modification, behavior improvement. They were all about the things that you saw on the outside of the person. And then Jesus shows up. And he shows that he doesn't care as much about what happens on the outside. He cares about what happens on the inside. Jesus was always going to the heart of the matter. He was always going to the heart of the person. He was constantly showing us that what happens inside a person matters so much more than what happens on the outside. And a lot of people get confused by this. They think Christianity is all about God rewarding good and faithful people, people who are strong, who stay strong, people who are faithful, and they stay faithful. And if we, this is what I was taught, if we want God to do good things for us, then we better do good things for God. If we want God's favor or God's blessing, then we have to earn it somehow with a measure of our own goodness. We have to show that we are improving and that we are deserving of God's favor. And sometimes this is what makes people feel guilty when they sit in church. They sit here and go, that's not me. So I must not be measuring up. So I, this whole thing must not apply to me. And I've, I've heard people use this story of Noah for a long time to try to prove that point. That that's who God is. That's the way God works. I've listened to a few preachers who seem to enjoy making people whom God loves, question whether God loves them. Constantly telling them to look at their lives. If you want to know if you're a Christian or not, look at your heart. Look at your heart. Just look at your heart. That's how you'll tell. Wait a minute. Anybody else remember what God said about the heart? God said that our hearts are deceitful, crooked, and misshaped. Sin has had an impact on the totality of our being. All that you are has been dipped in sin. Now, the thing that really gets me, this, this going with your heart thing. You know, go with your heart. What does your heart tell you? That sounds like a line from a Hallmark movie, doesn't it? What's your heart telling you to do? Listen, every time I've gone with my heart, I end up in bad places. Because my heart is deceitful. It's deceptive. And without the grace of God, without the goodness of God, without the faithfulness of God toward me, I'm in trouble. And so are you. Lots of sermons, lots of books imply that it's our faith that activates God's faithfulness. That if we want God to be faithful to us, then we'll, all we have to do, another one of my lovely, you have certain phrases that you just, you hear it, and as soon as you hear it, you kind of cringe. All you need to do is step out in faith. How's that working for you? 
If we want God to be faithful to us, they say you got to step out in faith. They're implying that by stepping out in faith, then God will demonstrate his faithfulness to us. If we keep our faith, then God will keep us safe. And the, the thinking goes on here. It's like, okay, God fight for those who fight for him, which is another way of saying God helps those who help themselves. Have you found that verse in the Bible yet? No, it was even on one of the uh, contest shows the other day. You know, is this verse in the Bible? Or where is it in the Bible? It's not. It's not there. But this stuff is everywhere in the church today. Now, if that stuff is true, and I'm wrong, if that's who God is, if that's what Christianity is, then the Noah story is not a picture of grace at all. It's a picture of who we should be if we want God's grace and his blessing. If our interpretation of Noah's story is that Noah was a good guy who was going after God's favor and God gave it to him because he was good enough, if that's our interpretation, then we should be good like Noah. You ready to build that boat in your backyard? That was really funny. Can you just use your imagination for a second? If everybody calls you this week, Dennis, and wants you to come over and help lay out the boat, you know, in their backyard, you, yeah. Not a boat builder, okay. <sighs> but if that's what we think, then we, we need to be doing that, right? So we can get God's grace. But what happens when our faith crumbles? I've been a Christian most of my life, and I can tell you that my faith crumbles on a weekly basis. Not necessarily in any big catastrophic way, but any time I find myself pending upon me, I find myself trying to control the circumstances, anytime I want to control people, anytime I want to manipulate the story, anytime there's something that I want because I think I need it, all that stuff I'm not exercising faithfulness. I am exercising faithlessness. I'm just trying to say my faith crumbles all the time. Thankfully, God's love for us is not dependent on our faith or the strength of our faith. But God's love for us is ultimately on the object of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. So what happens when our faith crumbles? How does the story of be a good person and always do the right thing, how does that story help us? How does that play out when your faith crumbles? How does that play out when you're questioning God? And don't tell me you've never questioned God. We all have. We wonder if God really cares. We wonder what's happening when everything falls apart. What about when you've prayed for something for years and years and years and it just falls apart on you? What about, have you ever had that feeling that God was almost trying to get back at you for something that you did wrong? You really do have those thoughts from time to time. So what happens when instead of standing firm, we cave? Wouldn't it be great if we stood firm all the time? But what happens when we let go of God? What happens when we quit trying? What happens when we fail? What happens when we give in to those bad habits again and again and again, whatever they may be? If God's favor is dependent on my faith, I'm in big trouble, and we all are. I wish I could say, great is my faithfulness to God. I wish I could say that, but I can't. And neither can you. What I can say is, great is God's faithfulness to me. I've said this to you before. I wish I could say I give everything to God. I can't say that, and neither can you. What I can say is God, in the person of Jesus Christ, gave everything to me, and that's good news. In other words, God loves us not because we're good. God loves us because he is good. It's that simple. Christianity is not the story of God meeting us halfway. It's not. It's also not 
God will love you a lot if you'll just give him a little. I haven't found that verse either. We, we say these things all the time. We'll say, well, you'll be amazed if you just give God a little and then watch what he does with it. But it's not that way. I got news for some of you. Christianity is not good advice. Okay? It's why I don't stand up here week after week and just give you good advice. That's not what this is all about. The job description of the pulpit is not to give good advice. It's not to teach us how to be better behaved. It's not to demonstrate some good technique that we can use in our lives because Christianity is not about any of those things. It's not good advice. It's not good behavior. It's good news. It's not, I will die for Jesus. No, instead, it's Jesus died for me. You, remember, you may remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember those three guys? Daniel's friends. They end up in Babylon with him. They're just young men. King Nebuchadnezzar, at one point, has these three guys thrown into a fiery furnace. But they do not die. In fact, when the king goes and looks, he sees that in the fire, walking around, are actually four men. It was God with them, keeping them safe. I choose to believe it was Jesus that was walking in the fire with them. And I love this. When they emerged from the fiery furnace, this is what the Bible says. Not only were they not burned, but it says they didn't even smell like smoke. That's quite a detail. That's how all-encompassing God's protection is. I love that story, but that story also frustrates me. You're going, well... Pastor, are you confessing things today? Yeah, let's just keep it. I'm on a roll, right? Let's, let's look at this. Here's why it frustrates me. I can't promise you that if I were given the choice between bowing down before the idol or being thrown into the fiery furnace, I can't promise you that I wouldn't bow down. And at the same time, you know what? I'd be telling God, God, I didn't really mean it. God... What's my death going to accomplish anyway? So, you know, God, I'll just, you know, uh, there's a high likelihood I would cave. Now, you may be sitting there going, I don't want to be at a church with a pastor like that. Yeah. I'd like to think that I wouldn't. But there's a great possibility that I would. And I can hear myself saying things like, I need to be here for my family. I need to be here for my wife. I need to be here for the crosswalk. So, God, I'll work this out with you. I will bow down, but I'm just pretending. I'm pretending to bow down to an idol. But in my heart, I'm not. Right? Now, I find a lot more comfort in the story of Thomas Cranmer. I can see by your faces you haven't heard this story. Thomas Cranmer was a high church leader in England hundreds of years ago. Queen Mary I who was nicknamed Bloody Mary, took him and put him in prison. She told Cranmer that if he didn't renounce following Jesus, she would kill him and his family. So he did. Just like that, he renounced following Jesus. He recanted what he believed so that he could save his family. But later, he felt so bad about renouncing his faith that he changed his mind. And from then forward, he refused to recant his beliefs. And the end result was he was burned at the stake. Now the story goes a little bit like this. As the fire was getting intense and getting closer to him, the first thing that he put into the fire was the hand that he had used to sign his original recantation. Interesting. That's how guilty he felt. I can relate to that story a little bit more because here was a guy who caved. Like maybe I would cave. Like I often do cave. So if Christianity is about good advice and good behavior and good technique, if that's what it's about, maybe you've mastered it. I haven't. And I've been at it both personally and professionally for a long time now. I'd like to think that I've gotten better over the years. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. 
So if this is all about our improvement, our getting better, if Christianity is all about empowering us to become better and better and better as we get older, I don't know where you find that in the Bible. If you know where it is, somebody please show me, because I'm open to learn, okay? But what I see when I study the pages of Scripture is I see somebody like the Apostle Paul, and what I'm about to share with you, this was said at the end of his life. This is a guy who preached the gospel to the then known world. He planted churches all over the place. And at the end of his life, as an old man, he said, and I quote, I am the chief of sinners. Interpreted into our thoughts today, he's saying, I'm the worst guy that I know. But it makes sense. Because the closer we get to Jesus, the more of our own imperfections we see. So it stands to reason that the older we get, rather than bra bragging about how we've gotten better and better and better, it's actually more honest to say, you know, I am more aware now than I was when I was 40. It was when I was 50 or even 60. I am more aware of how desperately I I need God and His grace. I'm more aware as I get older how much I need God's mercy. That is Christian growth in my book. That's what it means to mature as a Christ follower. It's not, I'm getting better and I'm sinning less. By the way, sinning less doesn't get you in anyway. You, you do understand that, right? You have to be sinless to get in with God. And there was only one was sinless. And he's the ticket that we have. We don't get ourselves in. He gets us in. We don't need a Savior who saves the faithful. We need a Savior who saves the faithless. We need a God who saves the weak and the spineless. We need a God who saves those who buckle under pressure. We need a God who saves and forgives the filthy rich. We need a God who saves the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. We need a God who saves the Roman soldiers who flippantly toss dice in the shadow of his dying body, all the while mocking him. We need a God who runs after us after we've run away from him. We need a God who holds on to us after we let go of him. We need a God who accepts repeat offenders. Amen? Anybody besides me? We need a God who doesn't hold a grudge against us because we keep messing up. We need a father who runs after prodigals like us with outstretched arms yelling, Welcome home! Welcome home! That's the Savior we need. And that's the Savior we have. So Noah was just as in need of God's grace as anyone else. Yes, Noah was a part of that group of humanity that was going off the rails. But God graced him. God favored him. God made him alive. And as a result of that, he developed a relationship with God. And I love how it says it. Noah walked with God. The Noah story is actually an amazing picture of grace. But don't miss the fact that it wasn't just something that happened one time. Noah walked with God. God. It's God's love that makes it possible for us to walk with God. It's, no, it's God's love that makes us even want to walk with God. Charles Spurgeon, I, I love reading the sermons of old, old preachers. He was a preacher back in the 1800s, Victorian England. And here's what he said. He said, when I thought God was hard, I found it easy to sin, to run away from him. But when I discovered God to be so kind, so good, so overflowing with compassion and forgiveness, to think that I could ever rebel against someone who loves me so much. That's what it's about. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 says, It's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance, it's His goodness. We're bad. We are so bad. Some of us need to come to grips with that. 
But God is so good, and that goodness he wants to share with us. So would you stand with me, please? We're going to pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you for reminding us that even when we're at our worst, you come in and scoop us up. You grab us up in your arms like a, like a grandparent grabbing a grandchild. Father, we love that picture. And some of us need to be reminded today that you're scooping us right now. You're letting us know how much you care about us. And Father, I pray for anyone in this room that has not made that decision to let you be that in their lives. Father, please bring them to the point of deciding that they want you more than they want anything else. Lead us now, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. All right.